Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a blueberry cider. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a glass of white wine, and on this week's episode, we will be looking at two cases of family murders. Both the Jamesons and the mixed cases feature the murder of an entire family for both known and unknown reasons. We will start with the unsolved murder of the Jameson family. On or after October 8, 2009, the Jameson family of Eufaula, Oklahoma disappeared. The family consisted of Bobby Jameson, his wife, Sherilyn, and their daughter, Madison. The family was reportedly considering the purchase of a 40-acre plot of land near Red Oak, about 30 miles from Eufaula, at the time that they vanished. The initial investigation into the Jameson family's disappearance indicated that they had probably not vanished on their own accord. The family's pickup truck was found abandoned near Lameter County, Oklahoma, a short distance south of Kenta a few days after their disappearance. The Jamesons' bodies were not found, but their malnourished dog, Macy, was still in the truck. Also discovered was the family's ID cards, wallets, mobile phones, a GPS system, and around $32,000 in cash. The Jamesons were not known for carrying large amounts of cash with them. Footage from the family's home surveillance system, time stamped the day they left from their house, showed the couple making several trips between their vehicle and home as they methodically packed to leave. In the footage, the couple's movements were described as quote-unquote trans-like. The video also shows Sherilyn placing a brown briefcase in the vehicle. Former Sheriff Camp remarked that he believed the briefcase could be an important clue. Both the briefcase and Sherilyn's handgun have never been recovered. The skeletal remains of two adults and a child were discovered by two hikers in a remote spot in Lamiter County in November of 2013, more than four years after the family went missing and less than three miles away from where the family's pickup truck had been abandoned. The remains were widely presumed to be those of the missing family, though the Oklahoma Medical Examiner's Office had to use orthoscopic, that's the word that's supposed to be in there, and forensic pathology testing to identify them. Officials confirmed on June 3, 2014, that the remains belonged to the Jamesons. A cause of death was not determined due to the heavily decomposed state of the bodies. There were several theories, especially before the bodies were discovered. Before the remains were discovered, several theories emerged about the family's disappearance, such as that they had faked their own deaths, they were in witness protection, they had been murdered, or that there had been a group suicide. Before the disappearance, Bobby Jameson was involved in a tense lawsuit with his father, Bob Dean Jameson, claiming that he had threatened the family and had struck him with his vehicle in November of 2008. The police don't believe that Bob Dean Jameson was involved in the family's disappearance or murder. Another popular theory was that the Jamesons were drug dealers. Investigators cited the large amount of cash found in their truck and the apparent strange behavior exhibited by Bobby and Sherilyn shortly before they went missing. The Jamesons have reportedly told their local pastor, Gary Brandon, on separate occasions that they had seen spirits inside their home and that Bobby had allegedly claimed to have been reading from the Satanic Bible. Although the murders of the Jamesons is unsolved, the McStay family eventually did see justice. The McStay family consisted of Joseph McStay, his wife, Summer, and their children, Gianni and Joseph Jr. On February 4, 2010, at 7.47 p.m., a neighbor surveillance system captured the bottom 18 inches of a vehicle thought at the time to be the McStay family's 1996 Isuzu Trooper. In their surveillance recording, the vehicle's occupants could not be seen. At 8.28 p.m., a call was placed from Joseph's cell phone to his business associate, Charles Chase Merritt, which went to voicemail. Merritt later told police that he ignored the voicemail because he was watching a movie. 
Joseph's cell phone pinged at a tower in Fallbrook, California. Over the next several days, relatives of the McStays unsuccessfully tried to contact the family. On February 13th, Joseph's brother Michael traveled to the McStay residence and climbed in and gained entry to the home upon finding an open window in the back. Michael did not find any family at home and their two dogs were in the backyard. On February 15th, Michael phoned the San Diego County Sheriff's Department SDSD and reported that his brother and his family were missing. Officers arrived at the home and requested a search warrant executed on February 19th, 2010. Although a search of the house found no evidence of a struggle or foul play, there were indications of a hasty departure. A carton of eggs had been left on the counter and two child-sized bowls of popcorn sat on a sofa. During their investigation, the police learned that around 11 p.m. on February 8th, the family's trooper had been towed from a strip mall parking lot in San Ysidro, San Diego, near the Mexican border. It was believed to have been parked there between 5.30 and 7 p.m. that evening. The car's location from February 4th to February 8th remains unknown. Because their car was found so close to the Mexican border, police reviewed surveillance footage of the pedestrian gate into Mexico. Video recorded the evening of February 8th, released on March 5th, showed a family of four resembling the McStays crossing the border. On February 19th, California police notified Interpol to be on the lookout for the family. In April 2013, the San Diego Sheriff's Department announced that they believe the McStays traveled to Mexico voluntarily. Unconfirmed family sightings were reported in Mexico and elsewhere, perpetuating hopes that they were safe and had left voluntarily. Relatives of the McStays doubted that they would travel to Mexico, saying that Joseph and Summer avoided the country because of the safety threat posed by recent drug wars. Other critics of the theory noted that the McStays had more than $100,000 in bank accounts with no withdrawal of funds in preparation for a trip and their accounts were untouched after their disappearance. Summer's sister stated that her passport had expired. Although it is possible for a U.S. citizen to enter Mexico without a passport, one is required to re-enter the United States. On November 11, 2013, a motorcyclist found four sets of human remains buried in two shallow graves in the desert near Victorville, California. Two days later, two sets of remains were officially identified as those of Joseph and Summer McStay. The deaths were ruled a homicide, and San Bernardino County authorities said they believed the family died of blunt force trauma inside their home, but declined to discuss specifics of the deaths or a motive. November 5, 2014, detectives from the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department arrested Merritt in connection with the deaths of the McStay family after discovering that his DNA had been recovered from their car. Merritt was charged with four counts of murder and the district attorney sought the death penalty. According to the arrest warrant affidavits filed in the case, autopsies concluded that all four victims had been beaten to death with a blunt object. Investigators believed the murder weapon was a three-pound sledgehammer, which was found in the grave containing the remains of Summer and her son. Investigators testified they believed the victims were tortured before they were killed. Prosecutors allege that Merritt had a gambling problem and killed the McStay family for financial gain. They said that he wrote checks totaling more than $21,000 on Joseph's business account in the days after the family was killed and then went on a gambling spree at nearby casinos where he lost thousands of dollars. On June 10th, 2019, a San Bernardino County jury found Merritt guilty of murdering the McStay family. On June 24, the jury recommended that Merritt be sentenced to death. The court upheld the jury's recommendation and Merritt was sentenced to death on January 21, 2020. Jenny, what are your thoughts on the murders of the McStay and Jameson families? They're both devastating. I remember the McStay murder before it was solved. I guess before we even knew they were murdered, really. I remember seeing like a Dateline special or something and people really had no idea. And all those sightings in Mexico, that's so interesting. I wonder who they were. People think, 
I know that I've heard people say that they think Merritt didn't act alone in this, um, but I don't know too much about that. And it's just horrible that everyone in that family had to die. The children were so young. Everyone was tortured, like we said, and to be beaten to death, it's disgusting. I know there's children in both of these cases, so it makes it really hard to stomach. The Jameson case is so mysterious. I'm kind of leaning toward that it was drug related, but the money there kind of, I don't know why it would still be there if it was drug related. You know, if someone was going to go and kill them, why wouldn't they take the drugs? I don't, maybe they saw, heard a car or someone approaching and they got scared and ran off. I think the family was using drugs. It could maybe explain their strange behavior leading up to their deaths as well. I guess murder suicide is plausible. But again, why is that money there? That really gets me. Um, That's what I'm hung up on. I hope it's solved. I'm not sure if maybe one day it will be. I don't know. We just have no details. And that's really sad and scary, too. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, the Jameson family murders is definitely one of the more mysterious cases, because we don't know so much, like you said. And because there are so many theories that are plausible. It's hard to weed out which ones make more sense. It could be drug related, but it may be more tied to them being users versus dealers. But then that also just doesn't account for why they would kill Madison in that. And like you said, why they wouldn't take the money. But I will also say their reasoning that they had so much in cash because they were getting ready to buy a property also doesn't make much sense to me. And it definitely seems like they may have been hiding something. I think that if you watch the video of how they were on the surveillance cameras, it definitely does seem like they are having a out-of-body experience, that they don't fully know where they're at. And we know that that can lead to all sorts of things. Murder-suicide does seem the most likely, but that also wouldn't account for the murder-suicide theory does seem to be the most likely option, but I think that has holes in it as well because then the question becomes, well, why did they leave their home? Why did they leave their truck? Why did they leave their dog malnourished? If there was some forethought, some pre-planning into it, why does it seem to be so many missing pieces to this case? I agree. I hope this gets solved. I think it's going to be one of those things where whoever is responsible for their murders gets caught on something else and possibly to get a better deal or something like that, they divulge information about the Jameson family murders. When it comes to the McStays, it's definitely another tragic case and it's such a stupid reason. It's so senseless. You kill four people because you couldn't keep your gambling debts in check. And you couldn't hold yourself accountable for the damage that you were doing with your own life. So you decide to kill four people. Just Merritt is a disgusting person. Definitely vile what he did. And I am happy that the Mistay family did get justice in their case. And We'll see what happens with Merritt's appeal process, but like many others before him, father time would likely get him before the death chamber would, and I'm perfectly okay with that. While the murder of an entire family is rare, both of these examples feature the question of what happens when known and possibly unknown business relationships go from collaborative to deadly. We're going to look at two other examples of vengeful business partners. And the first is that of Chris Smith and Edward Shin. Chris Smith and Edward Shin met while working for the same lead generation company in Southern California. They would go on to form their own company called 800X Exchange. 
while Shen had the appearance of a successful businessman and devoted to his wife and three children, he spent his time in Las Vegas, where he spent money on lavish weekends with other women and gambling sprees. In order to finance these trips, he stole money from the companies he worked for. In 2009, LG Technologies discovered the money that Shen had embezzled and pursued a case against him. He pleaded guilty to embezzlement in May of 2010 and agreed to pay a total of $800,000 to settle the civil case against him from LG Technologies. Paying that restitution would allow him to avoid prison time, but he needed Smith's sign-off to have the funds to satisfy the judgment against him. Shin had also racked up large gambling debts. In June of 2010, Chris Smith disappeared. Smith's family received emails allegedly from Smith saying that he was traveling. When time had passed without hearing from him, his family and law enforcement began looking for answers. In early 2011, a computer expert the Smith family brought in to analyze data in Chris's emails had discovered the messages had all been sent within the U.S., not abroad, and forensic tests performed by investigators at the former 800 Exchange office space had revealed large presences of blood. DNA tests confirmed the blood found in their former office belonged to Chris Smith. Shin was arrested at the Los Angeles International Airport in August 2011 as he was boarding a flight for Canada. He was still on probation from the embezzlement case, and so he was arrested for a probation violation as he was not allowed to leave the country. Shin insisted that Smith fell and accidentally hit his head on a desk, which caused a fatal injury. Shin was convicted in December 2018 of the first-degree murder with special circumstances and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Smith's body has never been found. Next, we have the case of Elizabeth Gill and Todd Wilbert. Wilbert allegedly had been calling Gill all day about money, according to court documents. He went to Gill's home around 7.30 p.m. Saturday evening, broke into the home via the back porch, and confronted her, documents said. At one point, Gill called 911 and said a man was in her house pointing a gun at her. A man's voice heard in the background of the call was confirmed to be Wilbert's. Gill was shot twice around 10.15 p.m., according to investigators. When police arrived at the home, several family members directed them to where she was lying. Gill was pronounced dead at the scene. Wilbert was found nearby, inebriated, and within reach of the suspected murder weapon. Wilbert is charged with first-degree murder, armed criminal action, burglary, and unlawful use of a weapon. Jenny, what are your thoughts on these two cases of business partnerships turning deadly? It's really sad. Not surprised that this happens in general, though. And these few cases that we've talked about today are not the only times this has happened. It's a really high stakes, high emotion, high pressure situation, and it's hard to work with people, especially, I mean, I don't know if these people were friendly, but if you're working with your friends or family, that's really difficult too. In general, there's just a lot at stake. Edward Chin's explanation, oh, uh, Chris Smith fell and hit his head, is such garbage. I don't, who would ever believe that? And if that really is what happened, why wouldn't you call for help? And where is his body? It really bothers me when we know that someone murdered someone else and, you know, they're in jail and they will not say where the body is. I don't understand why people do that. What is the point? You're already convicted. You have nothing to lose, nothing to gain. And I mean, maybe I just answered it because there's nothing to gain. But that's infuriating. It's a very high pressure situation. Money really makes people do crazy things and things that they probably wouldn't do normally. It really makes people desperate. And in their minds, I'm sure desperate times call for desperate measures. What about you? I agree with you. Money makes people act in ways that few other things can. And I think that we see in both of these cases, you have situations where The person that you have decided to trust most with money, most with your future, betrays you. And that is a business partner that you are 
relying on and one of the last people that you would expect to turn on you and not just turn on you, but actually cause your death. And I agree with you. It is very frustrating when after a person has been convicted, they still will not reveal the location of the body. I think that when it comes to giving the family the peace of mind and just the other side of justice, when it comes to the family wanting to have justice, being able to bury their loved one is an important aspect of that. And the fact that you are so self-entitled that you not only took a person's life, but in addition to that, you disrespect them and their family after death. It just shows how disgusting of a person Edward Shin is and every other killer that does that. And I agree, his explanation is dog shit. It really is. You claim that it was an accident, but then the body is not found. Those two things don't go together. Even if you didn't do what you needed to do when it happened, you know, such as calling for help, Why would you move the body? Why would you do anything to disrupt the scene? That doesn't make any sense to me. And I think that's just another insult on top of the fact that he murdered Chris Smith. And there were some reports in the Todd Wilbert, Elizabeth Gill case that they may have been in a relationship prior to their business relationship that may have also tied into it. But at the end of the day, that case is also unfortunately about money. And I think whether it's a business relationship or any other instance, we definitely see this come up a lot where money is the main motivator behind why someone else decides to take a life. And I think that it's unfortunate and I don't know what can be done to help alleviate that because people are always going to be bad with money, right? Some people are. And some people are also going to be bad with money and have no type of human decency, self-control to not inflict pain on others to relieve their own debts and to try to get themselves out of the financial troubles that they got themselves into. It's a question that I think about a lot when it comes to true crime, because it's a a mode of, in addition to things like being a psychopath and love, or what may be disguised as love, that comes up repeatedly. And so just, you know, putting that general question out there, like, what can investigators, what can the general public do to make sure that the common motives for murder is not as uh, prevalent anymore? And when it comes to business relationships, how do you shield yourself from these type of outcomes? What type of screenings can you do? I don't know if you can necessarily screen a potential business partner for whether they're going to murder you or not. It's also not something that people think about. Again, you're getting into a business with this person. You're literally placing your livelihood in their hands. And unfortunately, in these two cases, and like you said, many others, that person ended up not being who they seemed to be. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the Jameson and McStay cases. You can read more about these cases and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with an episode focused on Woodstock 99. As always, stay safe.